first John chapter 5 first John chapter 5 from verse 9 If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. He that on the son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and, life, and this life is in his son. This He that had the Son has life, and he not the Son of God has not life. Can this microphone be helped? Thank you. All right. Let's, let's read again from verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. And he that has not the son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, the subject matter of eternity, uh, particularly as it regards to our, our position on the face of the earth and as followers of Jesus, it is important that we understand from the perspective of God that okay um, first John chapter 1 verse 1 so that we can put the passages together first John chapter 1 from verse 1 Jesus 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 Chabunemi Oh, on me, Jate, Jesus, Mumi Ba. Oh, on me, Jate, Jesus, Chabunemi. Oh, on me, Jate. Jesus, come me back. I want me that oh, I want me that Jesus, chabune me. I want me that Jesus. Kemu mi ba, awo mi jate o, 
Awa mi date Jesus Chabune mi Awa mi date Jesus Kemu mi ba Awa wa jate o Awa wa jate Jesus Chabune wa Awa wa jate Jesus Oh awa mi date o Awa mi date Jesus Chabune mi Mumi One more time Awa mi date o Awa mi date Jesus Chabune mi Awa mi That which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ now so um i was trying to make a point that as believers as christians it's important for you to realize that Eternal life is not something that God thought of in the context of his design and desire for creation. That means eternal life is not just something that God decided to make possible or make available or make exist so that he can give it to people. It is not a solution originally it is not originally conceived of as a solution that God devised in order to treat a problem or to solve a problem that his creatures would have whether those creatures are human or non-human now the thing I'm trying to draw uh, into your consciousness is this that even if God never created eternal life or that which is called eternity, which is the locus for everything else that we do that we have, was still going to exist nonetheless. Now, by that I mean to say that the eternal, because God is eternal, God inhabits eternity. And not as if to say that God lives in a place that is called eternity, but it is that God's very existence is the embodiment of eternity. It is to say that God is the locus, God is the reference for that which is eternal. God is the reference of eternity, God is the context of eternity. God is the one that, in that sense, therefore inhabits eternity. Now, it's like the Bible says that. Um, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Isn't it? Now, whereas God is light, the Bible also says that God dwells in light that no man can approach. 
So you see that while God is the very essence or the very locus, while God is the center, while God is the fount, while God is the basis, while God is the author, while God is the, is the, is the locale, God is the source, as it were, of light. God is light, yet the Bible says that God dwells in light. In the same way, when we say that God inhabits eternity, we are saying that it is the natural context of the existence of God that God, because he is eternal, therefore must inhabit eternity. If you are with me, say amen. All right. Now, and because of that, it means, it means that any relationship that you and I may have at all with the eternal, with eternity, is a privilege that we are invited into, a privilege that we are brought into because even if you never existed, even if humanity never existed, eternity is eternity. E e eternity is what it is. Now, le let's, let's do it this way. You see, sometimes we use, uh, let's say, eternal life and everlasting life, we use them synonymously, okay? So, uh, we assume that if you have eternal life, it means you have everlasting life. You see, um, Everlasting life talks more about the a qualitative, no, a quantitative quality. It's a quantitative reference. So everlasting means that life that lasts forever, isn't it? Now, life that lasts forever, of course, means that backwards and forward, there will be neither an origin nor a terminal. That means if it is life that is everlasting, if the life lasts forever, it means it does not have an origin. It means it does not have a beginning. Hello? And it would mean that it does not have an end. But that is a language of time more or less it is a quantitative is quantity that how long does this life last and we say it lasts forever now eternal life on the other hand is more of a qualitative it amplifies the qualitative nature of the life that has this quantitative dimension now listen to me Everybody that will live forever, living forever, for instance, is different from everlasting life. Are you with me? Everlasting life is not necessarily the same thing as living forever. Not everybody who lives forever will have everlasting life. Hello? If you believe that people who go to hell are going to continue in hell and they are never going to die and cease existing when they get to hell. It means that they are going to be in hell for how long? Forever. Those that go to heaven, in quote, how long are they going to be in heaven? They are also going to be in heaven forever. So there is this forever on the negative side, there is a forever on the positive side. That is living forever. You might want to call it everlasting living. But because the subject matter of life is a particular usage in scripture. Life is a particular usage in scripture. That is why we read the book of John chapter 1. First John chapter 1 I mean to say. Because in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And that light shines in darkness. The life that I'm talking about is eternal in quality. The life that is attached to everlasting life is eternal in quality. We are not just talking about the quantity. So you can have a duration of life that never ends, but a quality of that life that is forever miserable. 
Did you hear me? All right. So, maybe at another time I'll try to do this. Um, let's, let's quickly, I want to get out of your way as soon as possible. 1 John chapter 5 verse 9. Let's get back there. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He that believes on the son of God has the witness in himself. This is a morning teaching, not an evening teaching. He that believeth not, God has made him a liar. Because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. This word record is the word testimony. Okay, now what is this record that God has given of his son? Verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life. Are you there? This life is where? In his son. So the record, the record is that God has given to us eternal life and this life, this one, this one that we call eternal life because there's that other life, but this one is in his son. When you look at that verse as a standalone verse, you may be tempted to think that that verse is about us, that God has given to us eternal life. And then just so that you understand, this life is in his son. However, the Bible says that this verse is actually about Jesus. This is the record. Because anyone that does not believe, all right? Uh, uh, anyone that doesn't believe has decided to set God up as a liar. But what is the record that God has borne concerning his son Jesus? The record of God concerning Jesus is that God has given us eternal life and that this life is in his son so the record is that god the record of god concerning jesus is that jesus christ is the location god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son so when you are looking at the location where human beings might now be able to apprehend the eternity of god the Bible says that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. It's in his son. What that implies is nobody, nobody will have hope of laying hold on eternity with God on eternal life if the person misses Jesus. If you miss Jesus, you cannot meet eternal life. Because the record of God concerning his son is that God, even though he has given to us eternal life, this life is in his son. Is in his son. This life is is qualified as eternal, as eternal life. And that we have seen it and bear witness and shown to you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us. Now, the Bible says the witness of God concerning Jesus is that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. So, in chapter 1, the Bible says that the life that was with God has been made unto us. Then they, no, the life was made manifest and they now called the life, that eternal life. So when Jesus came on the scene of human history, that was God congealing the invisible into a visible format so that men that are earthbound might be able to apprehend by the senses of the natural person the intangible things of his majesty so that the invisible can become visible and men can have actual tangible experience
experience of that which otherwise may never be apprehended. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is the locus of eternity. and People did not realize that they were trying to destroy the thing that held them. It's like when you are sitting down the branch of a tree and you want to cut it. It's something even worse than that. Are you going to take eternity into time in order to kill it inside time? If you kill eternity in time, where will be time be? Where will time be? Because time is a subset of eternity. People did not understand the mystery of the majesty of the possibility of Jesus inhabiting eternity and yet walking in time. They took it for granted so much that the arrogance of the heart of the fallen man felt he could actually kill the one that sustains creation in existence. And so in virtue of his humanity, they nailed him to a cross. But in virtue of his divinity, they had nothing on him. And I need for you to know that even though our outward man therefore perishes, our inward man is renewed. You need to understand that there is a way to come into the economy of the eternal. Jesus is our eternal model. You listen to some of the things that Reverend Austin was saying, you, 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 you would have gotten that already, that the wisdom of God the wisdom of God was to hide the superlatives of the kingdom in the very ordinary casket of you know, everyday human life and Jesus even walked there to the point that people looked at him and they could not even see him beyond the occupation of Joseph. He's not the son of Joseph. He's not the carpenter. They, they, they called him carpenter. Carpenter. And the point came, they say, you are not even 50 years old. We are talking about Abraham. And he said, before Abraham was, I am See, the Bible said that which was from the beginning. It is not that which began from the beginning. By the time the beginning was beginning, he was. That, that's the reason why Jeremiah said, but, how did the Jeremiah say, say it? Jeremiah said that the, 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 the God of Israel, aha, uh -huh, he said, the lot of Israel is not like them, 
for he is the former he's a former of all he's a former of all days the former of all days the former of all things means that everything that is he is former to everything that is in, in there are no words daniel said he is the ancient of days what does it mean to be the ancient of days it means this one is older than time you, you see no matter how far back you go to start to calculate days he is older than the calendar that decided to step into human history and instead of adoring him some persons actually attempted to kill him but this is it the record of God is that God has given to us eternal life and this life is where is in his son so the son of God is both the locus and the model of what eternal life the eternal looks in the crucible of mortality if you get that I'll be out of your way in 15 minutes I'm saying that sir if you want to know when eternity steps into mortality what does it look like so that you can keep that model before you we are saying eternity in view that means don't lose sight of it don't lose sight of it if you are going to have eternity before your eyes the bible said god has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son so to keep your lovely face ever before me this is my prayer. Make it my strong desire that in my secret heart no rival throne survives. No other love exists. No rival throne survives. And I serve only you. The way to keep eternity in view is to keep the locus of eternity before your eyes. If you keep Jesus before your gaze, you will not lose sight of eternity. Because he's the locus, he's the container, he's the anchor, he is the fountain of eternity. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, that in verse 1, in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible now says to us that Hebrews 12 Wherefore, seeing we are also, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Are you saying that? Looking unto Jesus. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. If you want to keep eternity in view, the admonition of scripture is looking unto Jesus. Put him before you. We are surrounded. Yes, there are many people looking at us but you should not be looking at many people. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We can pick their testimonies with our ears. But we must never lose gaze of the one that is before us. Looking unto, looking unto, looking unto, looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Look at that. The Bible said, who for the joy of Who for the joy that was set before him did what? He endured the cross. What you endure is called pain, right? He endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus, as you are looking at Jesus, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, keep him before your view. And as you are looking at Jesus, you are going to realize a few principles. The Bible says, 
this Jesus that is set before us, the locus of eternity, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame. If you are going to keep eternity in view, it means you are going to keep Jesus in view. And if you put Jesus in view, you are going to realize that there is a set of lifestyle disposition, a set of priority, a set of behavior, a set of courtesies that you must maintain in keeping with the one that is before your view. This is where you draw your morality from. This is where you draw your priority from. This is where you draw your observations from. This is where you draw your principles from. This is where you draw your philosophy from. This is where you draw your idiosyncrasies from. This is where you draw your pattern from. This is where you draw your example from. This is where you draw your motivation from. This is where you draw your encouragement from. And what do you see when you look at Jesus? He endured pain. And he despised shame. I can tell you. I can tell you. That your adventure into eternity. Cannot. Cannot. Cannot be productive. Cannot be successful. If you do not model after the one that himself inhabits eternity. When he came into this world. He showed us. The way that people that are of the eternal, the way that their lives are lived, what, what, what is the meaning of the life? How is the posture of someone that has eternity in front of him? In virtue of his humanity, he was human. In virtue of his divinity, he was God, he was divine. In virtue of his humanity, he suffered pain. In virtue of his humanity, he endured that uh, he went through shame. And the Bible says, in virtue of that humanity, there was something that was ahead of him, the man Christ Jesus. There was a joy that was set before him. In order to reach it, in order to enter into it, the Bible said he did what? He endured the cross. I want to ask you a question. How do you relate to pain? And I want to ask you a question. How do you relate to shame? Your response to these two things is an indication of your disposition towards eternity. Listen to me. A man that has eternity in view learns to endure pain. It's not like you are denying it exists. Is that you are enduring it. You know it's there. You endure it. A man that has eternity in view will learn to despise shame. You see, some people, some people handle pain better than they handle shame. Some people handle shame better than they handle pain. In Jesus, you see the model of what it is to deal with pain and what it is to deal with shame. When you are faced with pain, what do you do? Endure. When you are faced with shame, what do you do? Despise. Some of us, our threshold for pain is so high that what will make other people scream? You are still chewing sugar cane. You are not even aware. Your threshold for pain is very high. You can endure horrendous amounts or degree and intensity of pain. But you see this thing called shame. Na, 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 na. And listen to me. If you do not conquer, if you don't conquer pain and conquer shame, you will not be a... You will, you will, you will not be... I don't want to use the word successful. You will not be effective. You will not be effective in your relationship with eternity. Eternity in view. When Jesus put the joy that was set before him, before him, it affected his disposition. 
when they were nailing him to the cross it was not because he didn't feel it he felt it but because of the joy that was set before him there was something in view because of that thing in view he endured pain when jesus was crucified he was crucified without any piece of clothing on his body so you have seen jesus of nazareth the passion of the cross or the passion of the christ and all of that they have not been able to successfully fully act even in drama what jesus actually went through the romans will never crucify you with a pant with an undergarment no they will strip you naked the way you were born before they nail you to that cross and then they made a public statement a public spectacle out of your naked beating broken bleeding body on that cross the maker of the soldiers being subject to the nails of the soldiers the creator of the wood be nailed to the wood that he created you may not realize they, hi, how do they I don't know what the word is in English there is a word in Igala that is called a meli huh? they, they, what is the word somebody help me what is a meli in English I don't know that alright in, in Igala they say a meli can kill huh? that the, a meli of the matter is what even is killing me that is to say it's not like irony. It's like saying, can you imagine that it is the tree I created that is causing me this pain? It is this, this Roman guy, this guy, that pneumonia would have killed. Pneumonia would have killed this boy when he was only 14 days old. It was by divine fiat because his mother was a widow and he was an only child. That we said, let's keep the posterity of his father alive. That is the one with the hardest hammer. You see, they, they thought of the, the indescribable, the indescribable impossibility of what is now happening can kill you faster than the pain itself. If somebody is trying to hurt you, that's somebody made by God, you are also made by God. You know, both of you are creatures. We are talking of the creature trying to cause pain, mortal pain to the creator. There are no words to describe it. Are you with me? Are you with me? So when the Bible is talking about enduring, enduring pain and what despising shame, I'm trying to say to you that these are the attitudes these are the dispositions of anyone who has eternity before his eyes looking unto jesus why should we look unto jesus it is because the record of god is that god has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son So if you take your eyes off of Jesus, you have taken your eyes off of eternity. If you have Jesus before your view, you have eternity in view. And can I say to you, every time that you notice a distance between you and Jesus, you were the one who moved. Yes. It's like, ah, it's like God is far. You were the one that moved. God is the constant in all of the universe. To keep your lovely face ever before my eyes. So the Bible says, looking unto, looking unto Jesus. And the moment you started looking at Jesus, what do you see? You see a person who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. When Leah, when Leah Sharibu, how many of you know Leah Sharibu? Yes, Leah Sharibu is the young Christian girl 
that was among the people abducted in the, in the northeast. All right? And the reason for which she was not released is because she refused to renounce Christianity. All that was required was if you say, I renounce Christ. All right? And you recite the Muslim, the Islamic thing, that you are now a Muslim, we will let you go. Wonder of all wonders. I saw on Facebook at that time a number of Christians criticizing Leah Sharibo that she was just simply suffering from the consequence of having a religious spirit because that it does not cost anything to use your mouth and to say I deny Jesus and then to recite the Islamic thing when they leave you and you come back home you will continue with your Jesus that if she was wise she would no longer be in captivity and that what she did was foolish and it was a result of religion his religion they called it religion and I'm saying that this was coming from people that are supposed to be Christians they said Leah Sharibu should have that Christianity is not like Islam if you say it with your mouth so long as your heart does not mean it it's not a big deal that Leah should have used her mouth to say she's no longer a Christian I renounce Jesus and I receive uh, Islam that once she said so and they let her go if she comes back home she will continue her thing and this therefore is the reason some of them said why they have no pity for her this thing happened in the public space Christians were the ones championing this nonsense you know why because if you must keep eternity before you the model is you will need to learn how to endure pain 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 and then you will learn how to despise shame pain shame you know pain there is pain for the sake of the kingdom what told timothy say as a good soldier endure hardness 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 endure hardness there is pain pain of all sorts i'm not talking of shame yet pain can i tell you if you are conscious of eternity you will be conversant with pain yes you will be conversant with pain pain you will have emotional pain you will have physical pain pain i don't know i mean you know god even had to send angels to bring support to jesus the, the intensity of the affliction that was visited upon Jesus a, a normal man would have died before arriving at the cross if they lashed you like that you will die but I can tell you that all the pain in the world that could have been inflicted upon Jesus may not have come anywhere close to the shame of what it was that Jesus went through And you know why some of you cannot serve Jesus very well? Shame. You, you even have clothes to wear. But you are ashamed that people can body shame you. Body shame you. You hear when Reverend Austin was talking? There is no name. <laughs> there is no name. They have not caught some of us. For the sake of this gospel, sometimes when they have no argument, they will resort to physical insults. You see, everybody, likely everybody under the sound of my voice, if God gave you a chance to say, the way you are like this now, I give you three options. Three. Any three things you want to change about yourself. I don't know that there is anybody under the sound of my voice that will say, I think I'm perfect the way I am. I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody under the sound of my voice, including me under the sound of my voice. 
there, there, there will be a few things that I will love to change. Huh? There will be a few things that I will love to change about my physical body. I'm a fine boy. <laughs> but now me where I get this body, no it I won't change. It's the same for everybody. Don't laugh at me. Say God can. You see, my only problem, why I can't do public speaking, is this my nose. Can it just be a little bit pointed? Because every time I start, my, my nose is not allowing people to see me. <laughs> huh? Or you will say, this is my head, I have or God. What is or God in English? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the meaning of or God in English. And maybe from when you were in primary school, your classmates used to call you headmaster. <laughs> oh yo mo yo. They, they, they used to <laughs> headmaster. So so God now said, Go! You will say with this head. You are conscious of your body to the detriment of eternity. You know what Jesus did with shame? He despised it. You know how to despise shame? Is to behave to shame as if you don't know that shame is shame. Despise it. I need you to know that that's not something that happened to Jesus. It was something Jesus did. You are the one who will despise shame. Shame is not going to say, I'm, I'm despised. No. You are the one that will despise it. It's an intentional action. I don't know if I, I've told you that story, I'm sure, before. I used to have one yellow long sleeve. Yellow. Bright like that yellow. Brighter than that yellow, actually. Yellow. Like the thing is yellow and the fabric it was it was made for me at that season in my life the fabric never fades and does not need ironing long sleeve huh? it was such a multi-purpose utilitarian a piece of possession i flogged that thing for more than four years i was you could almost call it a uniform in that season in my life. If you wanted to describe it to somebody, say, you don't know that guy, that guy in Japan, say, which one? You can say, that one, that one where they wear yellow, say, uh -huh. I used to use that yellow on that suit. I used to use that yellow with tie. I used to fold the hand if I need to appear casual. It was my go-to. Then one day, one of my friends looked at me and said, bros, this, this is your shirt. He never do make you retire the thing. You know that when you are poor, you may look like you don't have dress sense. Isn't it? Oh, you don't understand. Mm. So, it's like, ah, no, that's the season of my life, Jesus. You now come, to, like I came in and I knelt down to pray. Hmm? There's a point in my life where I couldn't have done that very easily. Because, you know, when you kneel down, the sole of your shoe will become obvious, especially if you're in a congregation and say, all of you kneel down. I'm like, if we sit, we God not hear this prayer. Why, why? I will prefer to sit down. Just tell us to sit down. Anything to hide what is going on on that day. Because when I wear that shoe, I still know the temperature by not by checking i can tell the temperature from my toes i have used that i used that shoe to preach jesus huh preach preach the living daylight out of darkness the day that god helped me and i got a second pair of shoes and i left this one aside somewhere in the room, village hostel. I can't forget. I dropped it there. It was in that place for about three months. Then one day I came and saw the shoe. I was shocked. 
I'm like, what happened to this shoe? What happened to this shoe? I was looking at this shoe. I'm like, what happened to this shoe between when I dropped it here and now? You know why? I could never believe. I couldn't believe that I wore that shoe in that condition. So I was like, did something happen from the last time I dropped it till now? Did something happen to it? Nothing. One of the mercies of God to me in that season was like, even me, I didn't realize how bad the shoe was until when God helped me to get a replacement. You know? Okay, I know you come from rich families. You, you. But I'm, I'm trying to say to you, sir, I'm trying to say to you, sir, anything that can cause you shame, huh, it has a destiny. If you have eternity before your view, its destiny is to be despised. Yes. If you want to put eternity before your view, whether it is bodily, whether it is socially, maybe it's a casting. Say you a second-hand citizen. Now who know your, your family say your grandfathers na, na slaves then be. Then come this place. Now you want to talk as if whatever it is, despise it. See everybody talk. Even you female, even you female in this family, now na, 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 na see finish the even you again. Any form of shame that can become a deterrent, any form of shame that can reduce your favor, that threatens to reduce your favor for God should be despised. The destiny of shame in the life of a believer is despising. We despise shame. Let me tell you, people of God, let me tell you, people of God, if you look at the life of Jesus, you, look, you know, hmm, I know people like to say Jesus was very rich when he walked the earth and all of that. I don't totally agree. Hello? You know how many times Jesus borrowed people's boats? Even that day in Luke chapter 5, the boat he used, it was not his own, it was Peter's own. And Peter could have told him, oh God, I'm tired, I want to go home. He said to him, trust out, he sat in Peter's boat, he said, please, trust out a little. The boat was borrowed. The thing we are calling triumphant entry. You know, the, 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 that donkey was what? Borrowed. In fact, when the disciples were going, Jesus told them, he said, if anybody asks you and says, what are you doing? Tell them, the master has need of it and he will return it. That means, I know you didn't get it. Jesus said, tell them that when I finish using it, we will send it back. You know, so sometimes when you use it to do deliverance, you need to understand the end of the story. Jesus promised to return it back to... <laughs> Say, lose him and bring him. Yes, but I will return it. It was borrowed. Even the day that they were telling Jesus, is he good to give tribute to Caesar or not? There was no coin in his own pocket. He said, please, uh, anybody get more coin there? <laughs> he collected the coin from another person and asked, uh, whose image and superscription is this? Yet, that was the creator of the ends of the earth. Jesus is the one person alone in all of God's universe that had the chance to choose the circumstances of his birth in all ramifications. He made all the choices you would not have made. If God gave you a chance before you came into the world, say, I want you to choose where you want to be born, who will be your parents. I'm sure that all your parents will still be trusting God for the fruit of the womb. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Because number one, I'm sure that the African continent will not even cross your mind. Let alone your own particular parents. 
Then even if you want to choose Africa, Nigeria of all places, hey, we will do like this. Jesus had the, ch the chance and the choice to choose all of the circumstances of his life. He chose a Joseph that will not live long. You know, Joseph died before Jesus was an adult. The last time you, chose, you saw Joseph, Jesus was 12 years. By the time Jesus was starting ministry, at the age of 30, Joseph was gone. And we know for real that he was gone because when Jesus was dying on the cross, he handed his mother over to a disciple. You think that if the woman's husband was alive, he will carry her, his wife and hand to a disciple. And the Bible said from that moment, that disciple took her onto his own home. So it's obvious that the man was dead. That was how Joseph left James, uh, John, and the other. They had children. After giving birth to the children, Joseph died. Jesus is now the firstborn of the family. So the responsibility of taking care of that family now fell upon Jesus. He did carpentry to the point that they did only call him son of carpenter. They called him carpenter. Is this not the... After, even when they saw miracle, they made the vivid image of Jesus as a carpenter will not allow them to come to terms with the fact that the same boy in that carpentry shed trying to see how to take care of his mother and his brothers and sisters. Is, it the, is this not the carpenter? And even when Joseph was alive, he was poor. How do I know? The Bible says that when a child is supposed to be dedicated, huh, you bring a four-footed beast. I think it was a ram that you were supposed to bring. But the Bible says that if the couple is poor, that's the language of scripture, and they cannot afford it, then they can bring turtle, a pair of turtle doves. That is provided that they cannot afford the four-footed beast. When Jesus was going to be purified, when they brought him to the temple for purification according to the law, what did they bring to purify Jesus? It was a pair of turtle doves. Jesus had the chance to choose who his mom will be, who his foster father will be. He chose a Joseph that could not afford the ram for his naming ceremony. A Joseph that will die before he becomes an adult. Like he chose where to be born. Where did he choose? A manger. And you are here, you are ashamed and worried over circumstances of your life that you cannot change even if you wanted to. Meanwhile, Jesus that could change them did not choose to change them and they did not change his ability to deliver on destiny. Can I say to you, Anything that you cannot change cannot change your destiny. Okay, maybe you didn't get it. I'm trying to say that there is nothing you think is a disadvantage in your life that can be a disadvantage to your destiny provided that it is outside of your power. I mean to say the fact that I am black, I am African can never marginalize my destiny. It can't. Can I tell you what it means? It might mean that some of us, we need to work harder than others. Some of us, we need to pray more than others. Some of us, we need to strive more than others. And I've told you before, what God promises you is possibility, not ease. With God, all things are possible. He never said with God, all things are easy. It doesn't mean that things are not easy. Things are easy, but they are easy for him. I'm the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? For me, 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 me? That means no you, me. The answer is no. Nothing is too hard for you. But when it comes to you, Mary, if you tag along with God, what God promises is that with God, with God, you, with God, all things are possible. But none of this is really easy. Things can be hard, but they will be possible. Yes. You may, you may, Okay, it was in my, yesterday in my body that we were talking. You see, I, I, there was a point in my life, it's just changing gradually. Even till now, I still drive. There was a point in my life, one day I sat down, I said, am I a driver or a preacher? 
Because the hours I spend driving, they are more than the hours I spend preaching. I will drive eight hours to arrive at a place. Then they'll give you 90 minutes. Sometimes they'll give you 25 minutes. Sometimes they'll give you 30 minutes. Then when you finish, you now drive another eight hours to get back home. You, we, we, on Nigerian road. So when I, there is, there is one woman that is, a, I, I can't remember what her specialty is anymore. Is the osteopath or something that they used to call them. I, they, they, she now said that this is my lower back. This is my, that there is. I say okay. So when she said we need to do lower back manipulation for you, and then uh, that you are going to hear a sound, but don't be, don't be alarmed. Me as me hear sound. That's how the woman put me like that. So I thought, like my bone just did. I say Jesus. All the stress accumulated on my lower back. So sometimes when I drive, after like four hours of driving, I will just find a way to park and stand. When I come and I carry the microphone, it, it, we will preach without recourse to the back. Because when you consider the pain that Jesus Christ went through, I can tell you, you have never seen pain in your life. If Jesus succeeded with such pain, how can you fail with so little pain? You know why? It was because of the joy that was set before him. Even Jesus put something in front of him that motivated him. And he told himself, this pain is but for a moment. Our light and momentary affliction is working for us a far more excellent weight of glory. He knew that this thing is going to last for three days. But you know, three days Jesus Christ went through the cross and the grave when he rose from the dead. It's been 2,000 years since he rose from the dead, isn't it? 2,000 years later, the dividends of those three days of pain and sorrow and chaos and agony, the dividends are still multiplying. Is that not a good deal? No, talk to me. Is that not a good deal? How long do you have to live in this world? I don't know. If you're ambitious, maybe 100. Super ambitious, maybe 120. So what? Is 120 an irrational price to pay? Even if you paid all of it in pain for endless existence. You know how Paul said it? Paul said, for to me, to live, to live, to live is Christ. To die is gain. When you have that kind of orientation, that as long as I'm alive, I want to maximize Jesus. I want to maximize Jesus. Your attitude to pain will be endurance we are not trying to we are not trying to undermine your pain no we are not saying pain is not pain it is pain we are simply saying that because there's something in view when you do the comparison you know that this pain is not enough price even to pay for what i see before me so you go through it for the sake of eternity you go through it for the sake of eternity they will insult you. You will eat it like breakfast for the sake of eternity. They will insult you, shame you with your father. Maybe you don't even know who your father is. Everybody is talking. This bastard is also talking. No problem. There. Look at the shame and behave as if you don't know that not knowing your father is a big deal. Just behave as if you are not aware. That's what it means to despise shame. Are you with me? To despise shame. Everybody is talking, even this bastard. He doesn't know his dad. He too. Yes. He's shameful. Despise the behavior. Listen to me. It's not as if, let, let me tell you this before I close. 
Those things we are talking about them. They are not gifts. Nobody has a gift of endurance. Are you with me? They are not gifts. Say, well, it's because it's easy for you. It's not easy for anybody. Even for Jesus, it was not easy. Did you know how he cried? He said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? The only thing Jesus did not do was that he did not abdicate. It's not like he didn't feel the pain. The pain was real. It was intense. Intense. So we are not trying to undermine your pain. It's real. Huh? It's real. It can be intense. We are simply saying that there is something you need to keep before you to help you through that moment of pain. And then when it is shame, the same thing. Despise it. That means, let me tell you, like I said, it's not a gift. It just simply means that, you know, sometimes you will need to sit down. There are some of you that part of your problem is body shaming. It was one of the things God said to me when I was going off stage. Body shaming. I, you know how they use that word, particularly in this generation. Say, don't body shame me. Don't body shame. And you have become very conscious of it. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to sit down in God's presence and have a quiet moment with the Lord. The part of your body that people use to body shame you or the one that you yourself use to body shame yourself. Intentionally talk to God about it and say, God, from today, I admit that according to the general consensus of people, my nose is too wide or I don't know, maybe you'd have loved two more inches to your height or maybe you think you are too fair and there's no darkening cream so that you can be pure African queen, all right? Because I know those that think they are dark. They don't send God, they send to the market and they do something about it, right? Whatever it is, maybe you are too late. Bah! Say, any food I eat, I don't even know where it goes in this, my body. I've tried to add weight, it cannot work. Or maybe you think you are too fat. Say, even if I do dry fasting for 40 days, me, I just used to add weight. Once I start fasting, I start adding weight. What else shall I do? Whatever it is that is your problem, that, that anything, the thing that used to rise up and then it will, it will dampen your confidence, that thing. Be factual before God. One of the beauties of being sincere with God is that God is not a gossip. You see, when I stand here, when I stand here preaching like this now, God is not going to come to you and say, don't mind him. More. As he's doing that thing like that, now as if he's bold. Now just yesterday evening, he was before me crying. Cry, crying about his ear that his ear lobe is too big now he's talking as if uh, he's very bold and confident God your secrets are safe with Jesus they are safe with Jesus don't hold anything back sit before him and put the list of all of those things that cause you shame put them before him and receive grace over each of them. I despise you. You have no power over me. You have no venom over me. And big nose or no big nose, you have no power, you have no venom. And then take the look for the word of God that applies to those things. God has made me fearfully and wonderfully. Tell yourself that you have been accepted in the beloved. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 6. We have been accepted in the beloved. The place have been accepted is the most prestigious club that there is, not just in this world, but in the world to come. If I have been accepted where it matters most, I don't care where else I have not been accepted. In Hebrews it says, throw not therefore away your confidence, for it is of great recompense of reward. It, it, the confidence has been given to you by God when you became a believer. The instruction is don't throw it away. Throw not away therefore your confidence. I think it's Hebrews 13. Don't throw it away. Hebrews 10 I mean to say. Throw not therefore away your confidence for it is of great recompense of reward. There is reward for confidence. So pump your spirit with the things that God said. That is the antidote 
to the things that the world has said, to the things that you have said concerning yourself. And then the next time you step out there and you stand there, no ostentation, no ambition, no pride, but at the same time, no shame. I am what I am by the grace of God. If you don't like what I am, give me more grace. What I am at the moment, I am by the grace of God. If it's not good enough for you, give me grace. Give me grace. It's not a cause for shame. Just bring more grace. You don't like my nose? Do something about it. You don't like my height? Do something about it. Are you with me? Do something about it. Oh, you, you, you don't like that? They don't like that you are 38 years as a lady and you don't have a husband. Do something about it. Is it like they used to sell husband in local jam market and you refuse to go and buy? The person who thinks it's a problem, let him do something about it. So you will stand before God and tell him, my times are in your hands. My times, they are in your hands. Listen to me. The Christian does not need motivational speaking in order to fulfill destiny. That's why you have scripture. What we have is hope. 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 In hope of eternal life. Which God that cannot lie has promised. Hope. That's what we have. So the reason we talk like this is not because there are no issues. It's because we have eternity before us. And the protocol of eternity begins with enduring pain and despising shame. Can I tell you, people of God? Finally, if you learn to endure pain and to despise shame, you will not sin. Bro, every time that you are tempted to sin, the attraction of the sin is in the pain or the shame that the sin is promising to deliver you from. That's the power of sin. Pain and shame. Pain. And shame. Think of any sin you have been tempted to commit. There was a pleasure that it promised to produce and provide you and deliver you from a corresponding pain and there was a shame maybe that it promised to deliver. Why do people used to lie sometimes to collect extra money from their parents? when they are going to school. They don't want to appear and see their yellow shirt is uniform. Isn't it? You, you don't want to be embarrassed every time. You are the only one that is wearing the same shirt to every function. To avoid the shame of appearing as if you don't have dress sense. That's why you lie to your parents and added 25,000 naira over what was required by the department. And you know your dad will not investigate. So they sent you the 75K. You paid the 50K and then you used the 25K to buy something for yourself. To, to, guide, to, to change your wardrobe. So that you will avoid the shame of appearing as if you don't have dress sense. Sometimes it's because they will call you names. Say, ah! This guy, you just leave village. Your village never leave you. So you want to, you, you want to show that village has left you. That was why you compromised. There is no sin that is not promising you either deliverance from pain, deliverance or deliverance from pleasure or promising you deliverance from both. The reason why Jesus would have been tempted to avoid the cross was to avoid pain and shame. That's all. So the moment you are ready, you did, I'm not sure you got this my point. I need to get it before we pray. Sister, I'm saying to you that if pain is no longer a problem and shame is no longer a problem, sin is no longer a problem. Yes. If pain is no longer a problem and shame is no longer a problem, sin is no longer a problem. Every sin's attraction is either in the pain it promises to deliver you from or the shame 
it promises to deliver you from. It's as simple as that. Whether it is fraud, whether it is immorality, whatever it is, financial fraud, you know, sexual morality, sexual immorality, all of it is pain, pleasure, huh? shame, glory. That's all. So the world came up with a, 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 a coinage. That time when they used to do HIV advert, they say, if you know fit whole body, use umbrella. I don't know the current slang. That was when I was serving. I don't know what they are saying this day. So during service, I was a, I was a member of Pet Club. I'm sure some of you know Pet Club if you have served. Pet Club. Pet education training for HIV AIDS. So during our training, they were now telling us all this. If you know fit whole body, that's the pigeon. If you cannot abstain, use a condom. A for abstinence. B for be faithful. C for condom. And I said, my problem with this slang is the language of cannot. I'm happy to tell people if you will not, if you will not abstain. But don't tell them if you cannot abstain. Because you are making it look as if those of us that are not fornicating is because we can. It's because we can abstain. And those that are fornicating is because they cannot abstain. It's an insult to me and it's an insult to them. You are making them look like weaklings. What do you mean by if you cannot abstain? Tell them if you will not abstain. Let them take responsibility for their action. Let them know the only reason they are doing it is because they will to do it. It's not because they cannot not do it. So, and I say, so in pigeon, don't say, if you know fit whole body, tell them if you know one whole body, Because can I tell you, people of God, no matter how pressed you have been to commit immorality, there's a reason why you have never done it in church before. That's all you need to know that you can hold body. Nobody has been, no, nobody has been under such pressure to commit immorality. Like my libido is so hard, I am so horny, whatever, whatever it is. To the extent that you started making out inside church. No matter how bad it is, you will still be patient until you chose a convenient environment. You, you can't come out of that kind of situation and tell me that you fell. Why, why has nobody fallen into fornication in church before? You know, you arranged, you went into a space, you went into a room, you shut the door. You have to be sure that the environment was conducive for the sin that you are now about to commit. How can you be so intentional and come out on the other end and say you fell? Is that how to fall? Have you seen anybody planning to fall before? Have you seen anybody arranging to fall? Say, now nah, I, I want to fall, but I need to get into one room first. Then you go to the room. You say, I want to fall, but I want to be sure there's nobody here. You confirm there's nobody. I want to fall, but I want to be sure nobody can come in. So you jam the door. I want to fall. I want to be double sure. Nobody can come in. Then you lock the key. You lock the door. I want to follow, but uh, I'm still not there. You now remove your trouser. And in order to remove trouser, hey, it's not easy. Yo. It's not easy. There is belt. The hot dudes you need to go through to remove that trouser. There is a belt. You, you took the belt, you unstrapped it. Then you now meet one button. That's the second hot You remove the button. Then you come to the middle here, there is a hook. That's number three. You remove the hook. After removing the hook, trouser will still not fall on its own because there is a zip. Then you use your hand, you held the zip. And zipped it all the way down. That's number four. Trouser is still hanging somewhere there. Then you use your hand and help it to drop. After the trouser has finally dropped, you now meet boxers. You, you have a boxers under. Then you remove boxer. Now, how can you go through more than half a dozen steps of intentional, deliberate, 
personal consciously carried out activity and then they end you say I fell you are a very dishonest man have you ever seen anybody falling like that say this thing I'm doing now huh? I'm about to follow but, and, and I just they start I just now fall I won't fall but I still I sit there for road the moment you love Jesus more than the sin you will stop sinning it's not the sin that is too strong it's your love that is so weak And if Jesus is before you, you will say like my people used to say, If somebody can die for your sake, you should be ready to rot for his own sake. Our fathers used to say, because he died for me, I will live all my life for him. If you have Jesus before you, he will be your eternal example. And the model of Jesus is to endure pain and to despise shame. So after today, what are you going to do to pain? Talk to me. What are you going to do to pain? You endure pain. What are you going to do to shame? So people will look at you. I used to teach my people that that's how to be impossible for Satan. Satan will now say, what do we... There used to be that movie, they call it uh, Sound of Music. Very old movie. Huh? Maria, is it? There's a song that he sang in that thing, in that thing. How do you solve a problem like Maria? How do you solve a problem, problem like Maria? Does anybody know? Like, how do you solve a problem like Maria? That's the way I want Satan to sing over my life. How do you solve a problem like Gideon? Like this guy, if you give him money, he uses it as fuel to serve God. If you take money away from him, he uses it as fuel to service his devotion. Okay. Like, you see, Satan needs to come to a point where he is helpless about your matter. To say, we have tried him with poverty. He didn't budge. Let's pump him with money. They pumped you with money. Hey, ooh, the gospel was blazing okay married let's make sure that he doesn't get married oh -ho. you are serving god as if you are not even aware that marriage exists they say the, guy, the way this guy is going is getting this is sin is getting too much let's weigh him down they now finally allowed you to get married when you now got married you now became the proof that two are better than one Hell! You have to make up your mind. Huh? Come tribulation. Come trials and persecution. Huh? From my heart, I will cry out what? Maranatha. That's how one spirit used to say. Come tribulation. No, no when you're in this place, you shouldn't be trying to sing. Come. If I was in my own place, at least I'll try and sing. See, to you standing here. I can't be standing before you. You see, people will be scoring my voice. So that's why I'm reciting the songs. Come tribulation. Come trials and temptation. From my heart, I will cry out. Is to walk upright before you. And be blameless in your sight, my desire, my is to walk, is to walk upright before you and be. Oh, holy one, 
Help me walk. I'm be blameless. Oh, holy one. My desire. My is to walk, is to walk. Yes. My desire. Is to walk, is to walk upright and be blameless. Oh, holy one, oh, help. Walk. I'm be blessed. Oh, holy one. Oh, help me walk upright. I don't want to be bent. I want to be able to stand upright. No shame, no pain. We bent me over. Upright, upright. 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 The angulation of my life will be upright, upright, upright. Not down wrong, not down wrong, up and right. If he's came and they talk of Elena Sebelama, Iria Sande Sokinanta Kobe Natama, Arioko Se Saine Takabelomo, Areneno Arioma, Aine Semino. Arabana to Sasamina to Kepane Arigo Mene Kabinoko Paranati Atabe Aros Kepani Taba Paratomo Ati Sasio Kobe Talamanati My desire My I need help. It's to walk. It is raining over this hall already. It's raining. It's raining. We keep Jesus before our eyes. Help me walk. Desire. 